this evening, I, I want to talk about something that's, that's I'm gonna, I've got a lot of scripture to read and hopefully I won't be too long. Uh, uh, but this is something that's been burning on my heart for a long time. If you know me, you know this is what I talk about often. And, uh, and I want to just kind of reiterate what I feel the Lord is doing in this time and in this hour. And, and the, the absolute importance of what we do together in our togetherness. Amen. I, I've, I've said numerous times and I want to say it again. You know, if we, if we understand the why then the how and the what is a lot easier. Remember that? I'll just keep talking and hopefully Aubrey will get it right eventually. <laughs> it's a thankless job being behind the desk, I can tell you that. So and for me, I want to I explain. So this is what this meeting is called, or this message, called Build Up and Build Out. Or Build Up, Build Out. There you can see. Build Up, Build Out. Is there, is, there, is there reverb on this mic, Orbs? He's got his head down. Mm -mm. <laughs> the angel singing. So Matthew 16, 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you all say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? So I'm just laughing at this mark. So let's grab this one. All right. There we go. Same problem. <laughs> Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, maybe take the reverb off this one then. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Say, I will build my church. And the gates of hell or Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But that word there, I, on this rock I will build my church. And so I want to look at something here this evening. So he says, who am I? You are, you are, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so, and so Jesus says to Peter, you're correct in saying that. No man gave it to you but my Father in heaven. It's revelation from heaven that actually I am the Christ. I'm not just some prophet or some good man that lived and that's, that's doing the miraculous. Actually, I am the Messiah. I am the one that was prophet about, prophesied about in the Old Testament. I am He. I am the Son of God. So He says, blessed are you, Simon, or Peter, because on this revelation, so who are the revelation? The revelation that, that Peter is, uh, that, sorry, that Jesus is the Son of God. On this revelation, so we'll talk about who Christ is, of course, and then who we are. So I don't want to talk about identity too much tonight. But really he's saying, your revelation of who I am, which then presupposes you begin to understand who you are, if I'm in Christ. Amen? So of course that's very important. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His righteousness, Jesus is the Son of the living God. I am in Christ, therefore I have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because I've been placed in Him. Amen. There's only two places to be, either in Christ or outside of Christ. You are either in the ark or outside of the ark. Let me just say this quickly, that not everybody on planet earth is children of God. Only those born of heaven are children of God. They get to be called, they have the right to be called the children of God. Those outside of Christ are not the children of God. Even the, the Jewish nation today. Because they're not in Christ. That's the truth. Amen? 
I don't want to speak eschatologically and about the plans that God has, all that stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff happening there. But the point is, I'm going right now, you're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. So that I will build my church on that revelation. So therefore, this is the revelation that I am the son of the living God. And on that revelation, then he says some key words. I will build my church. Five words. Say with me. I will build my church. That word build is the Greek word oiki noki poiki. No, it's not. It's oiki oiko domio. For those of us South African, oiki poiki, what a boiki. Oiki boiki, what a poiki. Whatever you want to call it. That, look at that Greek word of build. Build up, construct, erect, strengthen. So Jesus says five profound words. I don't want to think about, I talk about identity this evening. I want to talk about what Jesus speaks about. He says, I will build my church. So what is Jesus building? Some of you are getting it. Let's try that again. What is Jesus building? The water's great, babe, but I don't need the toilet roll. So I will build my church. So we understand that from the time of Jesus, he has been building his church. Not so. What is he doing today? He is building his church. I will build my church. So on this revelation, Peter, I will build my church. So as I say, I don't want to talk about the revelation of who Christ is. Of, although that's a very important revelation. It's, one of the, it's the foundational thing for a believer to understand his identity as to who he is. It's one of the great revelations of the grace message that I am in Christ. Amen. But Jesus says, I will build my church. So you have a whole lot of people these days who have called, in America especially, it's called the Duns. I'm done with church. The Duns, yeah. That's what they call them, the Duns, the D-O-N-E-S. I'm done with church. You know, my parents had a bad experience, or I had a bad experience, or my mom and dad had a bad experience 20 years ago or 10 years ago. I'm done with church. No, the Bible says that Jesus is building his church. Amen. And you are there. You have the universal church, which is the church from the time of Adam and Eve all the way to now. And then, of course, this generation that's alive today, the universal church. But then you have what's called the local church that Paul was writing to in the book of Corinthians. So Paul was not writing to the universal church in his day. He was writing to the Corinthian church, those who are meeting in Corinth. Then he was writing to the Philippian church, those who are meeting in Philippi. And then he's writing to the Galatian church, those who are meeting in that area of Galatia. Of course, each little section, and he says to Titus or Timothy, go and ordain elders in every church as I directed you. Every local house. Amen? Who's with me? In Acts 9, verse 1, we read this. Meanwhile, Saul who was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Who was he breathing out murderous threats against? The church. Amen. The Lord's disciples. He was breathing out murderous threats against who? Murderous threats against who? The church. He went on... He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any there who, who belonged to the way, i.e. the church, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. He fell to the ground and heard a, Lord's, the Lord's, a, lo, a voice sorry, say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse 5, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Oh, hold on. I thought you were persecuting the church. I thought you were persecuting the Lord's disciples. And what does he say? 
eventually he says, you know, you're kicking against the goats. Remember? That's what, that's what Jesus said. To, basically, you, you are wasting your time doing what you're doing. Then he says, who are you? I'm the one. I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Saul was persecuting the disciples of Jesus or those who belong to the way, i.e. the people in local churches in, in and around Damascus in the, the, the that area, Saul was persecuting them, but yet Jesus tells them on the road to Damascus, you are persecuting me. Amen. And I can promise you now, it's a futile thing to go up and try and persecute the king of kings and the one who created the universe. Amen. Simply put, how one views, engages, and treats Jesus' church reflects how one views, engages, and treats Jesus himself. Do you get the, you get the mathematics there? Just the, that equals that? That's the bottom line. When we say negative stuff about the church, we're actually persecuting Jesus. When, when we are saying negative things about the guys down the road, we are actually persecuting Jesus. See, as a church, I don't think we understand the gravity of what we do as believers. Amen? Jesus doesn't want us to be speaking badly about him. As I said on Sunday, even if you have an, a, a difference of opinion of how those leaders manage or lead the church, hey, if you are on leadership there, if you're part of, that, a part of that core leadership team and you have access to the leaders and you go with a great heart and, and, you, and you are trying to bring change from the inside out and, you, and, you, and you're talking out your views and you, you know you're not being bitter and twisted but you're trying to bring with maturity just a different thing of what you feel God might be saying and it gets rejected, well you work it out until you get to the end of the road and you say, well hey, I can't walk with you anymore unless two or more in agreement, they cannot be together. So I will just then just kind of jet you off to the other side there and make my way somewhere else but I don't start saying bad things about the place I leave because it just might be my opinion Jesus loves those people and if they headed down the wrong road well they will reap what they're sowing down the line amen they will either flourish or they won't who's with me Jesus is building his church See, we have an enemy, my friends, called the devil. As a matter of fact, in, in, the, in the, the original Hebrew, it was called Nakash, or the shining one. Satan was called the shining one. And he comes to rob, kill, and destroy, and he wants to destroy the church. I believe a lot of what's happening, even in the States, we've got to pray for America, because as it goes in the Western world, generally it filters down to South Africa, or the rest of the world. Amen? They're a superpower. So whatever happens there will impact us. We've got to pray for the Americans. I'm, I'm convinced a lot of the stuff there, I'm not into conspiracy theories, but a lot of stuff there is orchestrated by the enemy because he wants to kill the church or at least depress her to such a state that she is confined and controlled. Amen? Like in a lot of communist countries. Who's with me? So listen to this quickly. Revelation 12, 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, and he went off to make war against her and the rest of her offspring. So the dragon, we understand, is Satan. And just before that, he was cast out of heaven. It says that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Don't you find that fascinating? I've said this before. Michael, the archangel, was, went to war. There was a war. It says, actually says there was a war in heaven. Those are the words. There was a war in heaven. Like what is God doing? Playing golf in another galaxy. Don't you find that fascinating? There was a war in heaven. It uses that word, war. God is, knows exactly what's going on. I can tell you he's tossed Michael and his angels to fight against Satan and his angels. And the Bible says that Satan wasn't strong enough. And so he was cast out. It says he was not strong enough. He fought Michael. They fought Michael. But he wasn't strong enough. And he was cast out. You see, God calls beings 
to partner with them. God could have easily just taken the devil and his angels and thrown them out of heaven. But he didn't do that. He said, Michael and that two-thirds of angels, you fight those guys. Because he is, he, God is into partnerships. Who's with me? <laughs> Amen? Even in heaven. There is a family in heaven. Just like there's a family on earth. Ephesians tells us there is family in heaven. With God as the Father. There is structure, organization. Amen? There's leadership, responsibility, all of that in heaven. Just like on earth. And then it says, Satan was thrown down onto earth and he was enraged. Say enraged. Maul. He was so angry. Think about enraged. This means you are just, uh, you want to kill. That's what he wants to do. And the Bible says, after that happened, it says, woe to you, earth, because Satan knows his time is short. And then it says in 17, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and, and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. The wo woman representing Mary, of course we don't deify her like the Catholics do. She was a lady who gave birth to, to Jesus. But it says he, he, was, he was enraged. And then he went, went to make war against uh, the rest of her offspring. And who was her offspring? Jesus. And then of course, look what it says. And those... So who is the offspring? Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to the testimony about Jesus. So who is the offspring? The church. So Satan is making war against the church, my friends. That's his goal. I'm convinced that what you see around the earth, there's massive shifts happening all over. And on the natural, it just looks like government's doing their thing, but it's not. It's principalities and powers behind those governments who are very often puppets of satanic things. And he seeks to bring about that organization to suppress and depress and control and shut down, rob, kill, and destroy the offspring of the woman who was the sons and the daughters of God called the church. Amen. Because he knows the stronger the church gets, the more it impacts any pseudo kingdom he might have. And he loses more and more control. So it's a battle, my friends, in the spiritual realm. That's why Paul says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Amen. But he's talking to the church as a collective. But of course, each one of local churches, universal is made up of the local church, made up of individuals. So the stronger I am as an individual and the more mature I am and the more I have a gain over my emotions and how I operate in my maturity, the stronger the church becomes. Who's with me? Amen. Amen. But Jesus is building his church. Where's my... All right. The sum is greater than its parts. I love that. The sum of what we are is greater than our individuality. But yet we don't lose our individu individuality. Amen? When you come in, you look how we're all dressed. No one's wearing the same clothes. No one's wearing the same shoes. No one's got the same hairstyle. Amen? We're all individuals, but we come together as a collective. I'm going to go three points and then we're done. Listen to this. When local churches gather, the sum is greater than the parts, especially as it pertains to the collective worship, ministry, and witness. And those are the three points I'm going to come to. Jesus, did I, did I, did I jump down and get to the end? I think I did. I might have. You might have to go back up. Who's on the, on the sound? Uh, Natasha. Did I, this, this quote, Jesus is God's plan A. Did I jump past that? Let's go back up there. There we go. Look at that. See that name there? That's my name. You can, you can quote me if you want. <laughs> Listen to this. Jesus is God's plan A, yes. But Jesus is building one thing, his church. So therefore, his, his church is his plan A. There is no other plan. 
No, 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 Jesus is God's plan A, Craig, not the church, Jesus. Well, the Bible says that Jesus is building his church. So if he's building something, therefore he's got plans, and it's only that one thing he's building. I've got a house on here on the bluff. There's plans for that house. There's only one plan. Jesus is building the house of God. He's building the church. There's only one plan. And that's plan A. The church, my friends, is plan A. So what happens to say, what does it mean that Jesus is building his church? Is he just some ethereal thing? He's got no real plan. There's not, nothing really, you know, as long as you just come on a Sunday and listen to the preach and, and oh, that's a lack of preach. Well done, Craig. Whew, nice. That's Jesus building his church. No, nope, that's not. Amen. As I said, Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy. He's got one plan, one plan only. His plan is to destroy Jesus' plan A. When you get born again, the worst thing you can be told is come to Jesus and you'll get a nice laugh. Matter of fact, Jesus says this to his disciples. This is what he says. It's in the Bible. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to lay your life down and carry your cross. He says, if a man tries to keep his life, he will lose it. But if he loses his life for my sake, he will keep it. And that's in the context of being a disciple of Jesus. But you can't be a disciple of Jesus if you're not a disciple of someone else. Because Jesus is building his church and his church is full of people. Who's with me? That's just me and Jesus. I, he's, I'm his, no, not that. You're missing the plan. You're off the book. You're off the plan. You're somewhere else, wandering in the bushes. Jesus is building his church. Who's with me? See, when we get a revelation of this, friends, I'm convinced it's going to change how we see church. And if we, if we change how we see church, it's going to change how we do church. Who's with me? But first we have to have a revelation of what the church actually is. And unfortunately, hundreds of years of religion, hundreds of years of religion, as some of that religion is still entrenched today in the world, is not about the church, really. It's just about the organization and the people leading it. That's all it's about. And getting your money. And people have become distasteful of that. And they see through the ruse. And they don't like that. And so, they, and so they, they become the duns. They jettison everything to do with church. But then Jesus is like, I'm building my plan. I've got my plan. It's plan A. And they go, now, nah, is that is a church? Are you meeting together on a Sunday? Yeah, nah, I'm not interested. Uh, is it a church? Oh, do you have, guys have a leader? Do you have leaders in the church? Yeah, nah, not interested. Does the leader speak about money? Yeah, I'm not interested. See, because they just lump everything together with what they've been through that has bad emotions inside of them. But the church is still God's plan A, friends. Amen. So we have to see through all of that and put aside... Oh, thanks, Ryan. I was just going to read it from here. just need my binoculars I'm done with it <laughs> oh, wrong one see unless if we don't understand this then 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 it's we, we're literally just hacking at doing church because we don't really know what's the point of it amen if we understand, as I read on Sunday, the book of Revelation, it's the church coming down out of heaven, the bride of Christ. We're coming down out of heaven. When we all together coming down out of heaven, out of heaven, coming down together, we're not going to be miffed that we didn't spend more time at the beach. I wish I'd spent more time at work. I wish I'd done more of my hobby. I wish I'd, we, we're going we're gonna to be sad in ourselves that we hadn't actually pressed more into building with Jesus as he built his church. I promise you now. And there are going to be many believers that are going to be sour at the leaders because they're going to go, why didn't you guys tell us this stuff? Amen. My job as a pastor, I want to get to that just now, but my job as a pastor is to make sure you get a rich reward when you walk and you stand before Jesus. Who's with me? 
When you stand before Jesus at the, at, at the, at the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, as the book of Corinthians tells us, my job is to make sure that you get a rich reward. If I don't help you do that, then I'm not doing what God's called me to do. Now, I'm going to upset a lot of people because along the way they're going to go, this guy's controlling, this guy just wants you to do what he wants you to do. He wants it. And no, no, actually he's not. He's just trying to get you to die to those things that keep pulling you back. If you're going to be my disciple, Jesus says, you're going to have to lay your life down. So the guy says, hey, listen, I see you actually got too much of your own life in you. Oh, I don't like you. You're controlling. I'm going to the church down the road. Amen. Actually, you know, Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to lay your life down. Can you try and find that scripture for me somewhere? Uh, I think it's somewhere. Let's check this preacher out. I once had someone come up to me afterwards. Actually, not them, their friend. They left. And they said, you misquoted. That wasn't in the scriptures. And my friend was very upset and she's left. Have we got it yet? <clears throat> no. So Jesus, if... You're going to be my disciple. Where, where's that Bible boss among us? Where, where is that scripture? John 15, 13. Thanks. Orbs, now we just got to get it up there. There we go. All right. Greater love is no one in this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Uh, and then the next one. Are you sure it's not before that? Come on, who's got a Bible? <laughs> my Bible's not here. I've got my notes up. Come on, babe. There's no one got a Bible here. Okay, remember now, masks and Bibles. See, this thing's making people lazy. Huh? Hey? Can the overhead projector. John 13. Oh, John 10. Sorry, Orbs. John 10. He doesn't know if he's right. No, John 10. Oh, my gosh. You guys all make me look bad here. John 10, 18. John 10, 18. No, he's back to John 15. What happened? <laughs> my phone's in my bag. Come on, Mark. <laughs> Matthew 24. Matthew, come, come up here, bro. Come read it. Come, come here. Come here, bro. Come tell them. Come read it, Grant. We want to see your legs, bro. <laughs> you better get it right, bro. <laughs> then, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it perfect bro they're clapping for me because i got it right i'm just kidding they're clapping for you all right so so okay it's not up there anymore Deny himself and take up his cross. Amen? And like I said, when we're when we in the new heaven, the new earth, none of us are going to wish we had denied ourselves less. <laughs> none of us. Hey, I wish I'd actually kept more of my life. Jesus actually tells us, if I lose my life for his sake, I will find it. Coming on a Sunday morning for an hour and a half is wonderful. But I don't think that amounts to losing your life in the eyes of Jesus. Amen. 
Jesus is building his church. Number one, big point, big point number one. When we come together as a local body, and this is for anybody leading a local church out there, I want to tell you this is for you. Let's preach this stuff. Amen. So Revelation 7 says, After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And verse 10, they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What happened to South African church of 60 years ago, the leaders of this, of this nation that introduced apartheid, apartheid? Do they not read that scripture as believers? That in heaven, it's every nation, every tribe, and every language. And all you had was white churches. Amen? I'm, I, I'm happy for demographics, of course. You go into rural areas, you're not going to see too many white people there because of who lives in the area. But I'm talking, this is a snapshot of heaven, my friends. Jesus said, let it be in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Here's a snapshot of heaven, of every nation, every tribe, and every color. There is no racism in heaven. Nobody, and, and we're not all exactly homogeneously looking the same across the landscape of heaven. John could see every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language in heaven. Amen. Every ethnic group. A snapshot of heaven. But look what they're doing. They cried out in a loud voice together, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They were worshipping God in their togetherness. When we come on a Sunday morning, when we get together during the week, when we get together in our small groups, let me tell you, friends, we can't just look at a Sunday and go, that's church. Matter of fact, I, I can't remember if I spoke to Jess. She does a wonderful job. And, and we thank God for her. But she wrote on, on, at the, on the Facebook the other day, hey, Sundays are the best days, and then put a, a photograph. And I actually said, if I so spoke to Rana, Jess, I said, well, let's not put that there, because Sunday's not our best day. Every day in the church is the best day. On a Wednesday night you're in the small groups is our best day. On a Thursday at a prayer meetings is our best day. When we gather together for a bride, Joe blogs his house, it's our best day. Every day as the church, it's our best day. Amen. The problem is the Western church is made all about a Sunday and then you get the duns going, bam, I'm kicking Sunday in the butt because I don't go to church on Sundays. Because we've made it all about a Sunday. It's actually every single day of the week. Specifically when we meet together. Amen. As I said, our small groups are exceptionally important. That when you come together, you can get to know his name and her name and get phone numbers and you can connect on a smaller, a smaller intimate group. Amen. We can see that in the New Testament. We see that in the book of Acts. Jesus is building his church and this is how he does it. And he's very concerned about numbers. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. It's, it's recorded twice in the New Testament. 5,000, 3,000 added in one day. Either the Holy Spirit's lying or someone counted. Amen. They say Luke, Luke was right in the book of Acts. So, so somewhere Luke knew that 3,000 were added in one day. How did he, could he just guess? What was this 2,127? Then, the, then the, they're lying because it says 3,000. And then someone, someone's lying in the Bible. Then you can't trust it. Amen. But God's not cared about numbers for numbers' sake. He's cared about numbers for, for momentum's sake. And I'll get into it now towards the end of my message. Who's with me? And if you arrive tonight and I refuel and there's three of us, and don't go, hey, well done, thanks for making it. You could go, excellent. And the other person's like, hey, yeah, Craig, Craig Dornan and me. <laughs> yes, this place is happening. <laughs> I'm bringing my husband on Sunday. <laughs> now, of course, we did have that at one stage when we first planted. 
there was four of us. But there was grace because we had only just started. If there was four of us 13 years later, we've got a problem. Amen. But the more of us that come, the more momentum we have. So you're walking like, oh, it's, hey, look, something's happening here. Yeah, I'm coming on Sunday. But it's because you decided to come. You don't realize what you're actually doing. You're not really here just for you. But if we can really understand that, we begin to build the way Jesus wants us to build. So collective worship. Hebrews 10. Quickly, let me, let me read this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Mm, I love that. Amen? And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Don't you like that? Let the leaders figure out how they may spur the people on. And it doesn't say that. Let me read that again. And let us consider. He's speaking to the collective church. The right of Hebrews. It's not the leader's job to spur you on continuously. Every Sunday after Sunday. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Let's, let's do it, people. It's actually it's supposed to happen this way. My job as a pastor is not to care for you. Did you know that? Clint? I'll read something just now, then you can ask me why I said that. Okay. So don't walk out now because I what? You'll see what I'm saying and why it's true. Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some on the habit of doing. So clearly there was a meeting of the church that God wants us, that Jesus wants us to do as part of his building. Amen. It's not man's idea. It's not Craig's idea. It's not Dawn's idea. It's not the leader's idea. It's, it's Jesus' idea. And he's saying here, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. So it's not the leader's job, it's we encourage one another. Listen to this. And all the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know about you, but there's some things going on. Listen, look at what's happening in America. There's some strange stuff happening on this planet. Stuff has never happened before. There's some strange stuff going on. Something is happening. Amen. It says, all the more, encourage one another. Let's not give up. Let's not form a habit of actually not connecting. Let's meet together, not just on a Sunday. Let's meet together wherever that local church, get in and meet together. All the more as you see the day, encourage one another all the more. So we should be picking up the phone and encouraging each other. Let's go. Let's go. Someone's falling off the wagon. No, come. No, don't fall. Don't get into a habit. Because that's what happens. You get into a habit. Lockdown has become a habit for some people. Amen. I'm happy just to sit at home and be watching live. Or just sit at home and not go to the beach on a Sunday morning. Because we're doing it for months. There was no child. Back to, uh, uh. See, you don't understand what Jesus is doing and how he's building. And it's become a habit for you because you've lost the revelation of what the church is. Amen. Who's with me? Is this, is this hard? Is this soft? Is this okay? Number two. Two points I'm done. Collective ministry. So first, collective worship. We come together as a church. Collective worship. Collective ministry. Ephesians 4.11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Look at that. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Jesus gave the fivefold gifts. Who's with me? Okay, can you see it? Clearly says it there. All right, can you see that? So Jesus himself. So Jesus is building his church. So what does he do? He puts the blueprint down. He gives those five gifts to do what? Watch here. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. My job, my friends, as a pastor. Or do you walk in the office of a pastor, Craig? I don't know. Give me 20 years and I'll tell you. I don't think you know what you're doing in the body of Christ till a decade, two decades later. As you mature and grow. Amen. It's not a sprint. It's a long marathon. 
Amen. But the goal is maturity. Thank you. So that the body of Christ may be built up. My job is not to care for you. My job is to equip you that you would care for each other. Who's with me? Look. So Christ himself gave those gifts to care for every person in the church. No, they would just be dead. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body may be built up. Let's keep reading. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, say mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forward by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Not heresy, wind of teaching, even biblical truth that wants to pull me off what Jesus is actually trying to build in that moment. Amen? So you have some, some believers, some guy arrives in town, they're, just, they're gone. Oh, we're going to this, this conference and that conference. Immature. Actually, no, I stick with what God is doing in my life, in my house. Who's with me? Backwards and forwards, and every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love. Who speaks the truth in love? Not just the leaders, it says the people, because we become mature. We're speaking to each other. Paul says, if a brother is caught in a sin in the book of Galatians, you are mature. Or spiritual, sorry, which is mature. That's why he says, I have to, the Corinthian church, I've got to speak to you as unspiritual, as babies. He calls them infants because they're squabbling and backbiting and divisions. So he says, you're acting like children, acting like babies. Who's with me? Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, a, in every respect, the mature body of whom who is the head, that is Jesus. And from him, the whole body, joined together and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Who's with me? When I, I love going to the gym. I like going to work out most days. Throw some weights around there. A fit for life. There's a little plug. It, it, my whole body has to go in order to benefit. One part of me doesn't stay behind at home. And then every day I'm working a different kind of body part so that I'm just, you can just be healthy everywhere. The point of assisting arms every day for five years. We are Popeye. Who <laughs> says, yeah, the whole body, from him the whole body, joined together, held together by everything, it grows and builds itself up as each part, say each part, does its work. The whole body, not just the leaders, the whole body. So the leader, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, their job is to equip the saints that every saint grows and becomes mature Taking their gifts, which I'm going to talk about now, our last point, their gifts as each part grows up, each ligament gets stronger and stronger, and there's a connection, and the body becomes mature. This is what Jesus is coming back for, my friends. Who's with me? And God doesn't mind waiting. Jesus waited 30 years until he was fully mature before he started his ministry. He didn't come out when he was 20 or 18, 30 so God doesn't mind waiting, but I'm telling you, friends, now's the generation. Now's the generation. Let's stand up in our maturity. Let the body of Christ begin to work together as each part does its work. But it's got to start in each local house. Who's with me? Each local house. You can't have 20% carrying the 80. Romans 12. For by the grace given me, I say to each one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. I'm coming to land. But rather think of yourself as sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, 
So in Christ, uh, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You hear that? We, verse 6, we have different gifts. Say, I have a different gift. I have been gifted. Listen to this. According to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is to prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, encourage. If it's to give, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What gift do you have? I don't have any gifts, Craig. I just come on a Sunday morning, I listen to the preacher, have a cup of coffee, and I go home. Are you missing the point? No wonder the body of Christ is struggling. We need to get people out of that mindset into, I have a gift, and I have something to, to give into the body of Christ. When I'm coming, see, when you came tonight, did you have this mindset? I want to come and listen to the preach. I want to come listen to what's happening. Oh, I like that. Actually, did you come going, I'm there to build the body of Christ. I'm there to connect. I'm there to take my gift and put it in there. So I want to say, well, what gift do I have, Craig? Well, we've got plenty of things. Matter of fact, I want to ask you to come on Sunday. We're going to show you a couple of things and invite you into a couple of things. We've got lots of things happening in the life of the church. We, we need you. But where does my gift fit, fit, Craig? Just step into something. And I promise you, over time, God will begin to move you into where you're strongest in your gifting. But start somewhere. Get involved somewhere. Put your name down somewhere. Put your hand up somehow and say, count me in. That's your, that's your road and your mark, your start off into maturity. Who's with me? Jesus is building his friends, his, his church friends. Amen. And this is how he does it. That's why Paul says here, whatever gift you have, then do it with diligence. If it's encouraging, encourage. Now he's not talking about outside of the church. This is the church in Rome that he was talking to. It's how we operate inside of the church and the gifts that we use to pull each other up. And my last point, and then we're done. Collective witness. So collective worship, collective ministry, and collective witness. Jesus is building his church, friends. This is how he does it. The witness of, this in Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. And thick darkness is over the people's. Hey, Craig, is Trump going to win the election? I don't know what's going on. Also, no, the Bible says that darkness is going to cover the face of the earth and thick darkness over the minds of the people. Darkness is not a nice place to be. Amen? We all want the sun to rise. But listen to what it says about the church. But, say but, the Lord rises upon you. And his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. This is the church, my friends, that Jesus is building. And he's inviting you to become a part of that. Amen. Forget about what's happening in the world. We have a collective witness. Well, don't forget about it. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Jesus is calling us to impact the world. Nations will come. Well, Craig, who are the nations are going to come to us? Well, the bluff and surrounds will come. I think so many times what's happened in the church is people have gone and says, we've got to go in the streets, we've got to go, we've got to go find the lost and bring them in. Actually, the brighter we are and the more we shine, the more people will come and knock on our door saying, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Amen. I don't, I'm not discounting evangelism. I'm saying the greater the witness, the stronger we are together. Jesus said, when people see your love for one another, they will be drawn to me. The more mature we are and the more we love one another and get tighter and tighter together, not an us versus them mentality, but just strong. Jesus waited 30 years until he was completely healthy and whole in himself. He was never sick, but I'm saying until he was completely focused on where he was going, did he suddenly appear. Amen? Jesus is building his church friends. As I spoke about momentum, and I want to end with this. If I take, and I said this the other night, the other day at Delva 12, in 12. If I take a bucket of water and I throw it against my vehicle, it might take some of the dust off. If I take two buckets, a bit of a difference. Ten buckets. A couple of years ago, there was a tsunami that hit Japan. It lifted vehicles 
from where they were parked and moved them four or five k's inland in the areas where it was flat. You see, when you have hundreds of millions of buckets of water being thrown at a vehicle at the same time, it'll move that three-ton vehicle five k's. Our momentum and our togetherness is very important. Very important. When we come together, you don't realize what you are doing. Amen. But the Lord wants to give us revelation that we're not just doing it by accident. We actually begin to do it on purpose. Because He doesn't build by accident. He builds on purpose. Amen. He lays every line down and every brick. We are the, 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 living, we are the church of the living God. Amen. We are living stones, the Bible says. Living stones. And see, I'm done. My, my notes are finished. Living stones. So therefore, we are organic and we have individuality and we move. But we are also stones that are placed into a building. I don't want to be placed anywhere, Craig. No one's going to control me. It's not about control. It's about building. Who's with me? Amen. Collective worship, my friends. Our collective ministry and our giftings as we come together and our collective witness. When we have these things and we understand this is the revelation that God wants to give us, that actually we are the church of the living God. He is building His church, but He uses mortal man, you and I, to partner with Him. God doesn't do anything outside of faith and partnership with human beings. He has decreed that from, the, from Adam. Amen. Adam and Eve messed it up. Jesus came and took the keys away from Satan and gave it back to us and says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose on heaven. As a church, we need to rise up with revelation and understand that we're not just a bunch of guys who meet together on a Sunday because we've got nothing better to do. We are coming together to be equipped and grow together to impact this world with the love and the power and the grace of God. Amen. Why don't we stand together?